Hey everyone, it's Josiah. Today we're talking about geohashes. When Twitter finally released the algorithm, I, like many other programmers, poked around at the code base looking for things that were interesting. I'm not huge into machine learning, but I am big into spatial data and GIS. So I wanted to know how Twitter is using location data and in what ways they're using it. Twitter just really wants to know where you are and they always are collecting your location. They're gonna to go to extreme lengths for that. They also use your location to know if you're in a blacklisted country or if certain types of media should be restricted to you. And among all of these things, they keep track of your location using something called a geohash. And before we dive into what a geohash is, let's actually just take a look at them. I'm sure we can kind of begin to intuit how they're used just by an exploration. Geohashes work by first dividing the world into 32 equally sized squares. Each square is represented by a different character. Then, each of these squares, once we click into it, is divided again into 32 rectangles, each with another letter or number. So when we select another rectangle, we now have two characters. Again, we have a third character and we can have a fourth and again and again and again as we add on characters each time. Each time we select another rectangle, the number of characters grows and the size of the box shrinks. This can happen up to 12 different times. And here it just gets so small, we can't even see it. These characters that we've recorded right up here, they correspond to a rectangle somewhere on Earth. And the number of characters that we had in that geohash refers to a precision of the geohash. So when we started out, we were at a precision of one, where we're looking at a bounding box of about 5,000 kilometers by 5,000 kilometers. And as we zoomed in further, we were looking at things that are 32 millimeters by 18.6 millimeters. That's precise enough for just about every single use case I can think of. And there's actually a technical reason why we're limited to 12 characters, and we'll get into that a little bit later. So say we have a longitude and a latitude. This coordinate represents some place on Earth. We can then encode that location into a string of numbers and letters up to 12 characters long. These 12 characters that's all that a geohash really is. Spatial indices are a collection of algorithms or tools that make it easier for us to represent locations on Earth without actually having to use coordinates. You might be familiar with a few of them, such as Uber's H3 hexagonal spatial index or Google's S2 index for spherical geometry. And if you're an R user and you've used the package SF, you've used the S2 spatial index whether you know it or not. So geohashes are just another one of these indices. Geohashes have a number of properties that make them rather handy to work with. Say you have two points. The closer they are together, they'll have an increasing number of shared characters in the geohash. For example, we have this one reference point. Then we have another one where the last character is a little bit different. That's 0.13 meters away. As we have fewer and fewer shared characters, this distance increases. For example, when we have only six shared characters, it's 141 meters away. This is super useful, particularly for databases, because databases are good at querying strings. And they're not really good at calculating pairwise distance matrices for every single location in your database. Imagine how many values that would be, right? Like a 1 million by 1 million square matrix? That's a, that's a lot of distances. If you wanted to find locations within some distance of a point, it would be a lot more efficient to search based on the geohash. Based on the approximate distance, you can truncate geohashes, say, to six characters to find locations that are within three quarters of a mile. Any locations that share these first six characters of a geohash will be at most 0.75 miles away. Let's take a look at an example. You're a tourist in Boston and you've just gotten off the train at Park Street Station and you want a coffee. You don't want a Dunkin' or coffee from the weird McDonald's across the street near Park Street. You want to spend, I don't know, five, six dollars on a well-made espresso. I just happen to know that there's a phenomenal cafe called George Howell not so far away. Let's look at some code that could do this search and ranking for us. First, let's take a look at the geohash six around the Park Street Station. And when I say six, I refer to six characters in that geohash. So anything that falls within this grid, I would say for this purpose, would be reasonable location to return. But now let's look at some code. If you don't know R, that's okay. This code is straightforward and I, I want you to take away the use case, not the code. First thing we're doing is we're loading in some libraries. We're gonna load dplyr, geohash tools for encoding our geohashes, and a janky package I wrote called Popular Times. The first thing that we're doing is we're storing the coordinates into an object called Park Street Location. Next, we're encoding that location as a geohash. Using the location, we can query Google Maps, looking for cafes, 
using the Parks Street coordinate. When we look at it, we see Espresso Love, Ogawa Coffee, Render, Starbucks, Cafe Nero, George Howell. So we see George Howell in there, but we need to validate how close each one of these places are to Park Street. We could, of course, do this by calculating the distance between each coordinate in Park Street, but that is overall computationally intensive. We can instead limit our results based on the number of shared characters in the geohash. So this function compares a vector of strings to a reference string and compares how many from start to finish are the same. So if the first letters are different, you're going to get zero. But if the first three letters are the same as the reference, you're going to get the value of three uh, all the way up to 12 because our reference is going to be a geohash of 12. In this code chunk, we first create a column to store the geohash. Then we count the number of shared characters, and then we can print our data quite nicely. Once we've limited our results based on the shared characters in a geohash, the option is clear as day. I don't want to go to Starbucks. I don't want to go to Cafe Nero. That leaves me with George Howell Coffee. This is unfortunately about the most you're going to get away from most videos on geohash, but we're actually just getting started. To me, this is insufficient. Sure, you may want to know how to use a geohash, but my goal is to have you walk away understanding how geohashes work. That's an important distinction. It's not knowing how to use a geohash. So if you're ready, we're going to go into a kind of deep dive. We're going to spend the rest of this time talking through the geohash algorithm step by step in such a way that you'll be able to implement it yourself afterwards. Then we're going to go through a quick, simple example of actually encoding it in R. The algorithm that we just used was actually reinvented in 2008 by a fellow named Gustavo Niemeyer. I say reinvented because back in the 60s, another fellow named GM Morton from IBM wrote this paper a computer-oriented geodetic database and a new technique in file sequencing. And what he described looks quite a lot like a geohash with recursive gridding. Well, it actually kind of is a geohash, uses the same techniques, but it's not the one that we use today. What's funny is that Gustavo Niemeyer claims to have not known about this prior work, which I don't doubt. It's not the first time in history that the same thing has been discovered by two separate people at two separate points in time. Somewhat like how we now have Leibniz and Newtonian notation for derivatives. Unfortunately for GM Morton, it's Gustavo's version that we all use. At the root, a geohash is an implementation of a Z order curve. It's not necessary for us to understand Z order curves and all their intricacies to truly understand how geohashes work, but it's worth diving into a bit. I mean, I don't even fully get them. In the field of mathematical analysis, there is an entire subfield dedicated to what are called space filling curves. In essence, there are a suite of algorithms that map two or three dimensional data into a single dimension. The Z order curve is one of the space filling curves that is used to map two dimensional data into one dimension. The Z order curve is used in a bunch of big data technologies like Apache Spark, Parquet, and Cassandra. It's all used to speed up search, but there's no way I can do justice to explaining them. So I really want to recommend that you watch three blue, one brown's videos on them. In geography, we're always dealing in at least two dimensions. We have a longitude and we have a latitude. Using a Z order curve, we can encode that latitude and longitude into a single value. And that's exactly what a geohash does. But how? Let's pay attention here. This is the only important part about a Z order curve I want you to care about. We're going to create a Z coordinate. A Z coordinate maps an X and Y dimension into a single Z dimension. This Z coordinate is what a geohash is. Say we have two numbers, X and Y. X is equal to 23 y is equal to 42, and from that we can create a third value, z. I'm going to make a leap here, so stay with me. All of these numbers can be represented in binary as a combination of zeros and one. In binary, 23 is 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. In 42 is 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. Each number is represented by eight different zeros or ones, so then they are 8-bit integers be exact. To get our Z coordinate, all we need to do is interleave them. Interleaving sounds fancy, but it's actually quite simple. So we take our number, X for 23, we represent it in binary, we take another number, Y for 42, represent that in binary, we take the first value of X followed by the first value of Y, then we append the second value of X followed by the second value of Y, and we do this until we've exhausted all the bits in X and Y. The result is a sequence of 16 bits. Instead of having eight bits, we now have 16 bits. And that's an important detail. When we interleave two numbers, we always double the number of bits used. That interleaving of bits is essentially all that a geohash really is. So do we just convert our X and Y values to binary and then interleave them? Well, well no, of course, it's not that simple. There are two ahas. The first has to do with the limitations of modern computing. 
So let's go back to bits. In R and Python, in most other systems, numbers that contain values after the decimal place are known as double precision floating points, which is a really long way of saying that there are 64 bits to a number. Again, that means our numbers are represented by 64 sequential ones or zeros. So when we interleave two of these floats, we'll end up with a number that is 128 bits long. That's more than most languages and tools are actually able to handle. Since we can only handle 64 bits, we have to truncate X and Y to 32 bits so that when we interleave them, we end up with 64 bits. The geohash algorithm implements a pretty creative way of representing numbers as binary. It's not just the actual bits of the number themselves. It's encoded. Let's look at how we can encode this. So let's start with an X value. X can fall anywhere in the interval of negative 180 to 180. We'll partition that interval into two separate intervals that is left inclusive. It can include negative 180, but it can't include zero to be in the left interval. It can include zero, but not 180 to be in the right interval. If the value falls in the left interval, then it gets the value of zero. If it falls into the right interval, then it gets the value of one. The value of 19, it falls into the right interval. So the first bit is the value of one. So now we set our initial interval to zero and 180. We again partition in the middle into two intervals. Since 19 falls in the left interval, we get a bit value of zero. And so on, and we do this 32 times. We do the same thing for latitude, but the initial bounds are actually different. They're between negative 90 and 90. We partition it, we find where the bit falls, and we assign a value of one or zero. And then we repeat this 32 times. So what does this actually look like on the plane? We start with a point that is in the upper right quadrant. We partition on our longitude, since it's in the right interval, it gets the value of one. Now we partition it again, it's in the left, it gets the value of zero. Again, we partition it, it's in the right, it gets the value of one. One last time we'll partition, it falls into the right interval again, so it gets the value of zero. Once we have completed our encoding on longitude, we can then begin encoding our latitude. The point falls in the right interval, which when viewed on the plane, is actually the top one. And again, it's in the top. So far, we have the bits one and one. And then again, this time it's on the bottom it gets a zero. And the last time it's at the top, it gets a one. So when we interleave the results for encoding, we get the value of 11011011. So I told you that a geohash is just a Z coordinate, but now we have a binary Z coordinate and it looks nothing like the geohashes we saw earlier. There's one last step we have to take to go from our binary Z coordinate to a geohash. Geohashes are base 32 encoded. Well, what does that mean? The number system that we use and are all familiar with is called base 10. That's because we have 10 unique digits that we use to represent the values 0 through 9. Binary is a base 2 number system because it uses the two digits 0 and 1 to represent our values. The n refers to how many characters are in the alphabet being used to represent our values. So base 32 means that there are 32 digits that are used to represent our values. These are a combination of letters and numbers. Typically, these are the letters A through Z and the numbers 2 through 7. Though the geohash algorithm has its own base 32 alphabet called the geohash alphabet. It contains the numbers 0 through 9 and the entire alphabet except A, I, L, and O because they look similar to numbers except A. They just needed one few characters. To utilize this alphabet, we need to define a lookup table that has our characters by position. So base 32 encoding requires five bits to represent each integer. Having five bits gives us 32 possible combinations from five zeros in binary being zero and five ones being 31 in binary. So if you include zero and 31, that's 32 unique values. You can think of this as two to the fifth possible value. Let's start thinking about how we can decode 32 bits. We have this sequence of 32 zeros and ones. We begin to decode it by breaking it up into sequences of five bits. For each of these five bits, we figure out what number they represent in our decimal system. So our first chunk of five bits is 11010. That's equal to 26. Our second group of five bits is equal to 2, then 20, 14, 9, and 0. Now, instead of a series of five bits, we have a number between 0 and 31 inclusive. We take these numbers and go back to our alphabet, looking up each one by position. For the first one, we'll look up the 26th element. This example uses Rust, so it's base zero, and the lookup returns U. We do the same for our second element, and we get two. We do this for all of our digits, and end up with the characters U, two, N, F, nine, zero. Boom, that's our geo. So next, we're gonna look at how we can do this in code. First, let's recap everything up until now. 
A geohash is a one-dimensional encoding from two dimensions. We create a z-coordinate from an x and y-coordinate. And to create a z-coordinate, we need to encode our x and y as binaries. We do this through a sequence of partitions along the number line. We split our range in half to create two intervals. If the value falls into the right interval, we record a one. If it's in the left interval, we record a zero. Then we adjust our initial interval to be half of which one the point fell in, repeat until we get 32 bits for both of our values. Once we've encoded both of our x and y's, we need to interleave them to create a new sequence of 64 total bits, after which point we break up the bits into groups of five. Once the bits have broken up, we translate them into integers, and from there, we encode them into our base 32 alphabet by looking at base on position. And that's the bulk of what a geohash is. The next part of this is really writing the geohash algorithm in code. And I'm going to leave that for a separate video. So if you're interested in that, go ahead and check it out.